Tell me about a con that you've pulled before. I took a test that I wasn't allowed to take. I was taking a self-paced- Who does that? I was taking a self-paced class and I was misinformed about what the deadline was to take a test. And the professor was just like, uh, yeah, you missed a deadline. I was like, yeah, I was misinformed. Look, this wasn't a case of me being lazy. I didn't fail to prepare. I just was told the wrong date and uh, I would love to make it up. I'll be happy to take whatever penalties. He's like, how about this penalty? You don't get to take the test. You're gonna take two zeros on that. You're probably gonna fail the class. The TA, the teaching assistant, she leans in and she goes, I don't agree with all the policies of Mr. Professor. If you will keep your mouth shut, you could take the test right now. Okay, went and took the test and did the thing. Days later, I was like, I can't believe that. Like, it was like the princess said, said, my father's an evil wizard, but I will get you freedom. <laughs> and then I looked and there was two zeros for those tests. I was like, what is this lady doing? She gets my hopes up or whatever. But then I looked at all my other scores and I realized that she covered her butt. She put down the zeros, but she took all the points and elevated all my other scores. Uh, so academic fraud. You had a co-conspirator on the inside. Yes, and it, I, 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 it was magic, it was magic. On the level of cons and danger and exciting and the planning that goes into a con, that one sucks. <laughs> You're not wrong, <laughs> but I did pass the anthropology, so take that. <laughs> Five con men who you should probably know about. So we're talking about five people who took con artistry to crazy new heights. For the uninitiated, we have new articles every single weekday at themodernrogue.com. This is one of our favorites written by Louis Prada. What did you think? I think the first one is something near and dear to our hearts. I, I think it's factually something I may have committed at some point. Subject one, Nick Russian, the fake reality producer. Basically, you've got a guy with the rad name of Nick Russian. Which, why would you trust anyone named <laughs> Nick Russian? <laughs> he doesn't even spell it the normal Nick. It's a N-I-K. Never trust the N-I-Ks. Yes. I'm picturing a guy in an expensive suit with a face that looks like a giant head of ham, and he's probably <laughs> got guns and tattoos. <laughs> and he walks in, he's like, I got a reality show pitch for you. Ex I'm Nick Russian. Exactly. Ooh, wait, he's Yosemite Sam. No, no, he's much more charming. He's like, a reality show, you <laughs> like it. It would be disastrous you for you to like not. <laughs> <laughs> it would be disastrous. <laughs> so this guy, this took place in England where somebody took out an ad saying, hey, I'm doing a reality show competition. You could win a hundred thousand pounds. Who's in? They got thousands of email responses and eventually whittled it down to what, like 30 participants? Uh, 30 participants uh, and uh, three teams. The goal was to make a million pounds within one year and you win 100,000 pounds? I'm telling you, it's a brilliant scam. It's so stupid, it just might well, work. Well, and this is the brilliant part, is that it took place in the realm of reality television, where that's exactly the kind of plan I would yes! expect to see, right? Yes, exactly. People just jump on the opportunity to be on reality TV. I call it the honey boo boo effect. Like, <gasps> we're gonna be on TV? I call it the hacking the system effect. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> People still just get excited about, oh my God, I'm gonna be a star. I'm gonna make money for just being myself because I have this amazing personality and I get to show off how many skills I have and how resourceful I am. This is an important part of any con game is that they take advantage of an inherent human flaw. Oftentimes it's greed or vanity in this case, or, or the, 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 the fear of being left behind if everybody else is on a thing. That's how people jump into Ponzi schemes. People love feeling smart and they love making money for nothing. Yes, so in this case, the guy d had none of the resources. He gets 30 people over, puts them into teams, and also says, by the way, you have to take care of your own accommodations. And so two of the three teams disbanded like in the first couple of days, but then the third team sticks together and they're like, no, 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 we're gonna make a million pounds and then we're gonna win a hundred thousand pounds because we yeah. made a million pounds. And then they started shooting their own reality show inside the reality show. That's their project, is that they're doing a reality show about being on a reality show, which again, is exactly what you would expect in a reality show. And finally, they had had enough, they knew it was a con, and they locked him in the apartment and called the news and yeah. started to look into it. Turns out, 
He had no production company. He had no credentials. He had nothing. He just conned all of these people for some weird reason. Which also is exactly what I would expect from reality television. I don't want to break your heart, but his name was not Nick Russian. His real name was, guess. Uh, Oliver Klozoff. <laughs> Close. Keith Anthony Gilliard, or Gillard, Gillard, Gillard. I would have stuck with Nick Russian, too. Here, here's what I want to know, is how many actual projects begin with somebody thinking they're pulling off a con, but at some point it just becomes too good and too real? Because what if they did, what if all three teams had million dollar ideas or million pound ideas, and then they just went nuts, and then next thing you know is he has footage of all this stuff. Like, in their mind, do you think the con men are holding out the outside possibility that maybe this is a good idea and pays off? Oh, wow. Yeah, like maybe he can parlay it into something, but he knows it's the longest of long shots. Like, what's the difference between a long shot and a con? I would say that window of possibility. And in this case, I weirdly, I think there is the window of possibility that he might have had the right idea and gone somewhere. He didn't go to jail. He didn't take anyone's money and he didn't hurt anyone. So they said, well, there's nothing to charge him he with. He just wasted everybody's time. Yeah. I mean, and I can't even count the number of projects that were a waste of time, including on our show. I may have conned some people into participating <laughs> in creative endeavors that never went anywhere. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to make so much money off of this short film. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what kind of grade do we give Nick Russian? Uh, I'm gonna say it was a disaster and an embarrassing failure, so uh, oh, I don't know, what, what, what scale are we grading I, I, him on? I'm giving him a B plus. B plus? I, I, I think, I really? think there was a decent, I mean, he spoke the reality television talk and did the re reality television thing. The only thing he didn't have was the backing of some big company, but I, I don't know, in an alternate universe, I could picture this actually having pulled off and him being wealthy and respected and a visionary for it. And he ends up with a functioning, successful television sure. show about these people People making money. So in, this, so in this case, this is just a bad artist more than a con artist. Okay, yeah. I'll, to, to I'm going to give him a C. A C? I'm going to no. give him a C. A C yeah. con man. Because right now, it just ended up with him being horribly embarrassed and probably drummed out of town. <laughs> yes. Right now, I'm really fighting the urge to punch you. You owe me, man. You owe 30 people. Nick refuses to answer any more questions. Subject to Carlos Kaiser, football trickster. All right, let's talk about Carlos Kaiser. What did Carlos Kaiser do? Nothing. Literally nothing. Except okay. for be really pleasant, make everybody enjoy him, hang out with uh, football teams, we'd call it soccer, and claim to be the greatest football player in the business. He would pay people in the stands to sing songs about him when the coaches would walk by so that everybody knew that Carlos Kaiser was the greatest player in the game. And but it, he really had no professional football experience whatsoever. He would present as such a bigger than life personality, like the Paul Bunyan of soccer, right? People were singing songs about mm -hmm. him that he wouldn't have to try out. And then the first practice, he would make sure to get injured, right, immediately, but then spend the rest of his time talking, joking, connecting with the rest of the team to where people on the team would say, you know what, even if he never plays, he's a really important part of the morale of our team. He's the spiritual center of our game. Like me. Exactly. <laughs> and, so, and so one time he was about to be put in the game. Like they were short on players. They're like, we got to throw in Carlos. I know he's injured, but hopefully we could see some of that Carlos magic. And so he walks and, he, and this is the way I imagine it. He's walking out to the field realizing, oh man, they're going to get me. They're going to get me. Even though I'm imagining nobody said anything. Maybe somebody says, hey, Carlos. He seizing on somebody. He's like, what did you call me? What did you say? What did you say about my mother? And then he jumps, jumps into the stands and just starts pummeling people, gets himself ejected from the game so he doesn't have to play. I think we can learn from this. I want to do something like this. I want people to go, yeah, you know, Jason Murphy, uh, I ran into him at the mall and he was just shopping and then a mariachi band showed up and just started serenading him, so. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with him. His career is already shockingly close to what I perceive mine to be. <laughs> well, I mean, he says he's, I know he's a great magician because he's constantly talking about what a great magician he is. Yeah, yeah. I think what's great about this is that Carlos didn't get charged with anything. He didn't commit any crimes, so he just walked away scot-free. Yeah, that's. this is another weird one. Like, is it a con to just overstate your talents? Because I feel like a lot of people, including us, do that. Here's the thing, though. He probably did get paid. Oh, sure. Yeah, he was hired onto the team. He got taken care of. I mean, he, I, obviously he was doing it for, uh, you know, money and, and fame and power and all that stuff. What kind of grade do you give him? I am going to give him an A. 
Whoa! I think this is a, a great con. He got some money out of it. He got some notoriety. Just by convincing people he was really good at a sport. So I, I, That's brilliant! A classic con, though, takes advantage of other people's weaknesses. And in this, I guess in this regard, he just took advantage of people not wanting to miss out. I, I, I don't know. Part, part of cons is being really charming, though. And that was what he did. That, that is true. That is true. I'm going to give him a C plus. Okay. A C plus. I, I liked Nick Russian better. <laughs> Subject three. George C. Parker owned nothing but sold everything. Okay, you know the old adage about, hey, I've got a bridge to sell you or something sure. like that. To uh, tell people that you think that they're a mark, that they're really gullible. That's actually a real story. Yeah, I spent two days in New York meeting with experts on this exact story. Two days doing research and interviews. I walked the Brooklyn Bridge and all that. It's all, uh, George C. Parker is the person who made that story the legend that it is today. And uh, there's various accounts of whether he sold the Brooklyn Bridge a few times or uh, some people say twice a week for 20 years or whatever. Eventually, immigrants were handed out pamphlets that would warn people, hey, you can't buy monuments, you can't buy stuff. Because he didn't just sell the Brooklyn Bridge, he sold the Statue of Liberty, he sold, uh, sold Times Square, he, he sold everything. How do you buy something like Times Square? Well, so first of all, you have a team. It's not just one person who walks up and says, hey, I own that, let, well, let me sell it to you, because that would trigger all kinds of alarm bells. Instead, he has a team of people working on the boats, ferrying people in, and they're not targeting the, the bulk of people. They're targeting the wealthiest 1%, you know, the 1% of the 1%. Folks who are coming in with pride and new world money, the sailors would drop hints about a wealthy person who owned that bridge, who's a really interesting character, you should meet him, I can set, arrange for a meeting. So they would set up a meeting and they would talk, and again, part of being a good confidence man is having that charisma, that yes. energy, getting people excited about it. And then he would casually mention like, oh yeah, I own that, I own that, I own that. And then there's the bridge. You know, to be honest, I've been thinking about getting rid of the bridge. And they're like, why? And they're like, well, there's upkeep and stuff. I mean, there's huge revenue potential. I could put tolls on the bridge, but I don't know if people would like that. But whoever does it will make a lot of money. And then they wait for it to be their idea. They're like, well, let me buy the bridge from you. And he would figure out what their budget is and then sell them the bridge with the fake deed and all that stuff. And it usually wasn't until they showed up to put signs, maybe they'd rename the bridge, because again, vanity, or they would put in tool booths, again, greed, that the police would show up, they're like, what are you doing? Knock it off, come on. <laughs> and of course, the police saw this time and time and time again, yeah. and then the, the police were like, yeah, no, you can't buy the bridge. And they're like, well, go get the guy. And it's like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> to me, the most amazing part of his story is that he was arrested three times for fraud, but one of those times, he escaped in the middle of his trial by reaching over, picking up a sheriff's hat, and just marching right out. Oh my God. Basically just walking like with the confidence, like, yeah, yes, of course, I'm a police. Hello, I police. How are you policing? We are police people. I'm not going to say that we should venerate this guy, but he might be in the modern rogue pantheon. Oh my God. He spent the rest of his life at Sing Sing Prison where allegedly he was super popular, where all he did is just regale everybody, including the prison guards, with tales of his exploits. This dude is an A plus con man superstar. Uh, yeah, even though he got caught, I'm gonna say A plus, that's great. I used to pull this scam on Ultima Online with my friends. <gasps> what? Yes. Ultima Online? Uh, you remember Harv? Harv figured it out. It yep. was in the early days of Ultima Online, an MMO video game that launched in 1996. It was one of the first MMOs. We would walk up to a boat that would be docked somewhere, and we would stand next to it, and people would go, hey, is this your boat? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> in fact, I'll sell it to you. And we would just hand them a book, where because you could write anything in the book. I remember you real time would swap money for objects, and so they you uh, there would be a book or a scroll that would say, uh, deed to boat, deed of ownership. That and we you, wrote in the book. Yes, okay, and the way Harv told me is like, you guys had pages and pages of instructions on how to drive your boat, use arrows down, up left, and do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then by like page seven, when you had enough time to be long gone, it says, by the way, you can't buy boats in Ultima Online. <laughs> yes, yes, Harv figured that out, and then we just did it over and oh, over that's so and good. over. <laughs> all right, I give you an A plus, sir. <laughs> Yay, virtual money. I still have all that cash in a nice place in Britannia. <laughs> Subject 4. John Spano, rich in character. All right, talk to me about John Spano. Spano? Spano. 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 Sponge. There's no N-Y. That's a sponge. He nearly bought the New York Islanders, a hockey team, which buying a sports team is one of the more extravagant things you can spend money on because it's a lot. Dude, this is already, I'm thinking in terms of the great pantheon of Khan, it's like, well, this takes advantage of, of vanity and pride. Like, this is one of those things everybody wants. Although he was the con man. 
So, uh, explain to me how he did this. Well, he basically just told everyone he was rich, and he convinced everyone it was rich. And when you're rich, people are really okay with giving you more money. So he was able to get an $80 million loan, which he said was easier than getting a loan for his car. Well, yeah, because you get a loan from a car, somebody wants to double check your stuff. If you just uh, infiltrate a set of friends who are all super rich, and $80 million is like, you know, chump change to them, then why would they, uh, it's like, no, He's clearly rich. Yeah. We went uh, vacationing last week. And technically, he owned the team for a while, even though the transaction wasn't 100% complete. The problem was that whenever you buy a sports team, everyone locally, all the sports fans, are going to be paying close attention. So the news started digging into him, and he made one crucial mistake. He sent a fax from his home fax rather than from some business place Pretending in Dallas. Pretending to be, oh, so, okay. Wow, yeah. what a, what a, what a small detail, but I have to imagine once a certain level of scrutiny, if it wasn't that one fax, it would have been any number of a million other things, right? Like yeah. once you get enough eyeballs on you, this is why I am always paranoid and always live my life like the whole world is watching because I just assume they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's becoming more and more clear now. A lot of these cons you really couldn't get away with in the age of the internet. Like now, I think uh, John Spano would have a really difficult time because anyone could find out, oh, that guy's just some schlub. He works at Domino's, you know, or something right, like right. that. Right, uh, So yeah, you, there's really so much more visibility. You can't really do much in the shadows, or at least you have to completely change your method. This is also classic con man uh, modus operandi, where, you know, by plugging himself in with a group of elites and availing himself of their largesse, uh, I, I, I give him an A-plus for ambition. Uh, for execution, I'm not gonna ding him too hard because if it wasn't that mistake, it would have been something else. I don't know, this seems like a solid B. I think so. Yeah, yeah, right? He got really far, and technically he owned the New York Islanders for weeks. Plus, here's the other part, this could have been one of those things. Let's say the loan went through, let's say nobody ever caught on to it. Let's say the Islanders went on to win the championship. He could be a legit, uh, super famous rich person. Yeah. And, and he would be the only one who was like, yeah, no, I didn't have any of the money, everything was a lie, but it doesn't matter, we're winners. Yeah, and honestly, that seems to be how capitalism in America works. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to upgrade him to a B plus now. I think so. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Subject 5. Count Victor Lustig. Comically smooth. The one and only. All right, this one sounds like an urban legend, right? Did you hear about the guy who sold the Eiffel Tower? You're talking about Victor Lustig, who is the person who inspired George C. Parker, because he, uh, George C. Parker thought, well, I could sell the Brooklyn Bridge or the, or the, uh, 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 Statue of Liberty. I was gonna say the America Lady. <laughs> the America Lady. <laughs> a problem. That's good. That's good. Um, That's but, good. But Victor... I love it when you forget things <laughs> that you just have no business forgetting. America lady. <laughs> like, that would be, that's, you say an America lady is like me saying, yeah, your co-host on Modern Rogue. Oh yeah, uh, magician dude. Um, <laughs> magician guy. Spiky magician. <laughs> America lady. <laughs> Before he sold the Eiffel Tower, Victor Lustig was already a prolific con man. He was, one of his favorite scams was to sell a cash machine, something that would print allegedly perfect copies of counterfeit bills. So instead of, you know, actually a counterfeit hundred, it would be a, a real hundred, but he would just crank it all out and then sell them for $46,000, up to $46,000 of 1920s money, which is $600,000 nowadays. And he did a couple of those. Oh, sure. Yeah, and yet he was able to convince a scrap metal company to buy by the Eiffel Tower. That's the crazy part, is that number one, yes, selling the Eiffel Tower is crazy, but the fact that you would sell it for parts, for scrap, and that somebody's just like, yes, I will uh, dismantle this and, yeah. and take it home. Yeah. And they thought they were gonna make a mint by saying, hey, we're gonna sell you uh, all of this uh, cutlery that's made from metal from the Eiffel Tower. It's like, people love that crap. And of course, we have one of the classic elements of a con man is so many of the con artist stories go unreported because they're so deep deeply embarrassing to the parties who were there. Yeah. So as a result, they don't report them to the authorities. It's like, okay, well, it sucks that I spent $70,000 to a scam artist, but what are you gonna do? Take out a press release to tell the whole world? No, you're just gonna quietly, you know, grant embarrassed. Yeah, these are all of the ones that they have heard about, that people have found out about. 
these aren't the ones that people were completely successful with their cons. Yeah. And everyone just kind of slunk oh, into the that's, corner. That's right. There, there's probably five even better versions of these that got away with it and yeah. that we'll never know. All right, so what grade do we give Victor? Based on what we know, I'm going to give him an A. Yeah? He wasn't as prolific as George C. Parker, so I don't think I can tie his A+, plus, but he was a pioneer, so I, I'm good with an A. That works yeah. for me as well. I like it. He even convinced his mark to bribe him so that uh, Victor gave him the best deal and gave him exclusive rights to buy the Eiffel Tower. So, oh, wait a minute. So so before even selling the Eiffel Tower, he did a pre-sale. He's yeah. like, why don't you slip me some cash and then you can slip me more cash. Exactly. It's pretty so, good. Brilliant. I want, let's get him on the show. Okay. Is he still <laughs> sure. around? Uh, where's the Ouija board? I, mean, I, I got this. Uh, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Pull out the changeling. <laughs> he shows up here. <laughs> he starts summoning the spirit. <laughs> Lady. <laughs> and that's how he sold it. He's like, you want to buy the America lady?